I am pleased to welcome everyone to this final of six sessions in our annual 2021 Summer Institute for Reconciliation, hosted by the Center for Reconciliation at Duke Divinity School. My name is Valerie Helbert, and I am program coordinator for the Center for Reconciliation and will be serving as your host for this session. Over the past few days, we have talked about reconciliation using the metaphor of a journey. And we've noted that although we come from different places and understand and hold different pieces of a collective truth, that we are on a common journey. We are secure in our imperfections and failings because we understand that we belong to a God who not only encompasses the final picture, but also allows us to see glimpses of that final destination in the here and now. Yesterday, Dr. Wylin Wilson reminded us in our plenary that transformation is at the heart of a new creation and that lament and is an, important, is an important spiritual discipline and gift for us, the people of God. Especially, she says, a lament that leads to hope. Now, as we prepare to reflect in this final session on hope and liberation, please join me in a word of prayer to begin. Liberating God, your son taught us to pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let justice roll like a river and righteousness like a never ending stream. Let your will be done. Let those who mourn be comforted and those in bondage be set free. Strengthen our hope in you, O oh God, for we long for your everlasting reign. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to love in this time that we share together and in our days ahead. Amen. Now I'd like to welcome our CFR director and our incoming Dean of the Divinity School, Dr. Edgardo colonna Marique, who will offer some framing for the next steps of our common journey. Edgardo. Thank you, Valerie. Um, gracias y paz. Dios nuestro Padre, Dios mío Jesucristo, está con ustedes, grace and peace be with you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, we have been on a journey uh, of three days, and it makes me think that how much can change in three days. Uh, three days uh, is the time from Good Friday to the day of resurrection. And it, it's the Paschal mystery. It is the the mystery who is Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh and who tabernacled among us. I like that translation of the word made flesh uh, and tabernacling among us, pitching his tent among us because Jesus journeys with us. Jesus walks with us on the way. He is the way and he is also the one who walks with us on the way. And in this way, Jesus Christ uh, as the as the is at the center, the Alpha, the Omega, uh, the center of the journey of reconciliation. The journey we've been in began with a simple question: Where are we going? And how is it that in our journey, uh, where where does reconciliation go? What are we doing in this journey? Well, and this, we spoke about that, the journey having a clear destination, a destination that we that has been given to us in scripture of the new creation, a, a new vision of the future, that if anyone is in Christ, there is already now a new creation. Hmm. And that we are and that we've been journeying these past couple of days, we've been reminded of the priority of this gift, that God has already reconciled us. To himself and to each other and that this gift gives rise to a responsibility that we are the bearers of god's amnesty proposal god's plan for forgiveness and for transformation and for making all things new 
And because God is already in the time business of making all things new, this is also a time for celebration, that there are signs of newness among us. And we have heard of some of these signs of new creation in our midst through some of the various presentations and, and stories that have been shared uh, by the plenary speakers in the various panels and in the breakout rooms. We're reminded that we have been reminded that, as Desmond Tutu says, there is no future without forgiveness. To which I would add also that there is no forgiveness without fiesta, without celebration at the signs of new creation in our midst. And so we've been in this journey to try to learn to see again, uh, to learn to see with, uh, as we heard in the, those of us who were in the presentation earlier today, with eyes of glass and eyes of flesh, to learn to see transcendence in the midst of our ordinariness and the earthiness of our existence. And we have been here to be recalibrated uh, to Christ because the journey is long and we lose our bearings. Even as we have a common destination and a sense of new creation, there's also the sense in which we sometimes lose our way. The horizons close on us and it is hard to see and we need each other. We walk together, together with Christ, to be to find again our true destination, to well our true east, to be oriented, to find our new uh, uh, our orient, our destination in Christ, the morning star, the one who who, who uh, rises to lead us into the new creation. And that, but the journey did not end at new creation. It, we moved on to speak of the second day of lament and the framing questions like, where are we? How did we get here? What's going on? And the gift that is lament, a strange gift that we heard, we heard wonderful reflections yesterday of the significance of this gift, that lament arises from seeing the present reality, the seeing reality and seeing, seeing the world as it is right now seeing the broken relations, the sordid loyalties and loves, seeing how, uh, seeing the rise of nationalism and the corruption of patriotism, seeing fences and isms being built and institutionalized. Lament voice is a voice of suffering, a cry from the depths. A real suffering is a cry, it's a confession, a, con a cry of solidarity, a cry of confession and a confession of sin and also of confession of faith, that we have a God who hears us and that we believe God will intervene. And that is why we say, God, how long? We say how long because we believe that God will want to do something about what is happening here. So lament is this song of solidarity, this communal cry. It's really a, also a school of hope because at the heart of lament is also the assurance that our crying is not in vain that there is a God who hears, a God who cares, and a God who will act and is indeed acting. And so in this sense that lament is not simply grumbling or complaining or whining, it is in fact doxology, praise, a confession of praise in a minor key. Now, as we transition to this day, we have to be careful to not think of this sequence as one where we leave things behind and that we are now somehow done with lament. We're not. Uh, the, these, these three days, in a sense, are also uh, three watches of the same night. Uh, and, and, and we journey with continue to lament. But now lament opens us our eyes and our ears to a new gift and to the question of what does hope look like? What does, uh, where do we find hope? And the gift of this day of, the, of stories and li of liberation and hope. Now, hope and liberation are much misunderstood words. Uh, the, the, the liberation is often seen as a loaded word that because it's seen as some, somehow having Marxist or socialist uh, hues to them. And, and, and liberation and reconciliation together may seem something like an odd couple, uh, but they are in fact soulmates. And they are in fact soulmates. And this is something of the gift of uh, 
African-American theologians like J.D. Otis Roberts and James Cone, who understood that liberation and reconciliation belong together. Uh, J.D. Otis Roberts saying liberation and reconciliation are the two main poles of black theology. And, J. D. Otis, uh, and, and James Cone saying liberation and reconciliation are tied together and have meaning only through God's initiative. And so we, spe we speak of this gift of liberation and of the gift of hope. Now hope, we have to be careful not to confuse hope with optimism. Mm. Hope is not optimism. Hope is hard. Hope is hoping against hope. Hope is not simply uh, think based on a calculus that things are gonna work out, uh, nor is it a matter of uncertainty or saying like, or wishful thinking. It's something much deeper. It's not having a half glass full uh, kind of attitude. It's really a gift of God. Uh, the author of Hebrews speaks of hope as a sure and certain anchor for the soul. Uh, and so hope is something that grounds us, something that keeps us on the journey and something that we, we also hear and see signs of hope. And that is why we are here today to tune our ears and to uh, focus on our, our eyes on where is there hope and liberation among us. Let me give you a few keys, uh, a few things to look for. Uh, what does hope and liberation sound like? It sounds like the miracle of metal morphosis swords and being beaten into plowshares and spears being shaped into pruning hooks. It sounds like the singing of a mighty multicultural choir from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. It sounds like the, and looks like the groaning of a pregnant woman, a pregnant creation world that has been groaning in labor pains until now, as Paul says. It sounds like the roaring of a rushing river with the tree of, the, of life, with its leaves for the healing of the nations. And so as we journey and we, and we come to this, this time in our journey and to reflect on the gift of liberation and hope, I want you to keep uh, these words in mind. And they are from uh, Pedro Casaldaliga, uh, a, a, a poet, a uh, bishop of Brazil. He says, in Spanish, I'll translate it to English. Nuestra esperanza es muy concreta. Our hope is very concrete. Tiene nombre. It has a name. Y tiene carne, espíritu, historia. And it has flesh, spirit, history. Nuestra esperanza tiene nombre y apellido. Our hope has a first name and a last name. El nombre es Jesucristo. The first name is Jesus Christ. Y el apellido es resucitado. And the last name is resurrected. La respuesta de Dios es Jesús. God's answer is Jesus. Él es el sí de Dios, el amén de Dios. He is the yes of God, the amen of God. Para, and to help us now reflect on these matters, I'm going to introduce our first speaker for today. Uh, my colleague, uh, good colleague, uh, Dr. Norman Wurzbach. He is the Gilbert T. Rowe Distinguished Professor of Theology at Duke Divinity School, uh, author of numerous books, including Food and Faith, A Theology of Eating and Way of Love, Rediscovering the Heart of Christianity. Uh, this fall, he'll publish his latest book, The Sacred Life, Humanity's Place in the Wounded World. And when not teaching and writing, I'm told that he likes to play guitar, make things with wood, and bake pizzas and cake. Mind you, he's never invited me to share any of these, so I, I, I see this now as a promise uh, or as a, as, a, as, a, as a pledge. So. Please, Dr. Wurzba, welcome, bienvenido, and we are eager to hear what you have to say to us. Where is there hope and liberation in today's world? Thank you so much. So first it is it's wonderful to be with you. We have had a feast over the last several days listening to people and I don't know that I have much to add. There's been so much wisdom shared already. So I hope that uh, my comments this morning will be seen as an opening rather than a closure because the themes of hope and liberation, of course, are immense and complicated and rich and 
uh, we can only begin to touch on the many themes that would be valuable for us to to talk about. And I think we'll have time later and, and Dorothy will lead us in some wise reflection on this as well. I would like to start with two quotations that will guide some of my thinking today. The first comes from Ecclesiastes, uh, the ninth chapter, where Kohelet, the sage says, whoever is joined with all the living has hope. And the second is from Linda Hogan, an indigenous author. And she says, we want a healing, I think, a cure for anguish, a remedy that will heal the wound between us and the world that contains our broken histories. So let's begin. When I speak with people about environmental degradation and destruction, racial injustice, the plight of migrant agricultural workers, the innumerable extinctions of plant and animal species, or the millions of children who go to bed hungry every night, I know that I now risk inducing the symptoms of what some mental health professionals are calling pre-traumatic distress syndrome. This form of PTSD happens when people are bombarded like so many concussive blows by an unrelenting stream of bad news. They recognize that multiple disasters are here and that more are on the way, but they also feel powerless in the face of what seems like a systematic effort to degrade, waste, or destroy life. It's simply too much to bear, so they retreat detach emotionally, and look for ways to shield themselves from yet one more eco-social catastrophe. They don't often want a detailed list or exposition of what is happening. They want instead to get straight to the heart of the matter. Are there grounds for hope in a world saturated with injustice and becoming increasingly uninhabitable? Young people, routinely ask me if they should still plan on having children. In this presentation, I want to explore some of the grounds for hope and offer a response to people who are earnest in their searching for hope, but also, and quite rightly, suspicious of the vague assurances and the hypocritical posturing that often frame our invocations to be hopeful. If, as Wendell Berry suggests, hope lives in the means, not the ends, then hope does not depend on having figured out what the future will be. This does not mean that the future doesn't matter. Rather, the cultivation of hope depends on inspiring the commitment and then also developing the practices that can position people to live now in ways that affirm, nurture, and heal life, ways that draw people more sympathetically into relationships with others and their shared places. In other words, hope has everything to do with activating the love, which is the only viable means for creating a world characterized as shalom, a world of peace, compassion, mercy, and mutual nurture. We do not owe people of the future an accurate prediction of what their life will be. What we owe them is our commitment to do now the good work that will lessen the prospects of a future nightmare. As I develop my account of hope, I will be taking my cue from Kohelet, the sage of Ecclesiastes, who, as you have already heard, said, whoever is joined with all the living has hope. If you've read the whole of Ecclesiastes, you know this is not a simple or naive hope. Pain, suffering, vanity, frustration, bewilderment, loss, and death, these all feature prominently in the picture of life that Kohelet portrays. I think we need this picture because it alerts us to the central role that vital relationships with fellow creatures and deep connections with places play in the cultivation of hope. Hope is an existential need because it creates in people a desire to join with others 
in the performance of a shared life. The work of joining may be difficult and beset with all manner of frustrations, but hopeful people believe that the effort is worth it because this life, despite its many wounds, is precious, even sacred. If hope resides and manifests itself in a commitment to honor and nurture life with others, then it is clear that the stress, anxiety, cynicism, and depression that many people feel today undermines hope. Hope withers when people detach and withdraw from others. Hope grows when people discover and commit themselves to furthering the goodness and beauty they believe to animate this world and its life. This is why it is so important for us to keep our focus on the practices that help us join in a shared life with others. The key is to cultivate the skills and disciplines of love that can connect with the divine love that is always already working in the world. The love I have in mind isn't something we simply create. It is what we encounter as we engage fellow creatures in the work of making a shared life. Our hope, in other words, resides in how well we participate in the love of God, in the modes that this love has been revealed to us in the history of Israel, the embodied ministries of Jesus, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to pause to make a very important theological point, which is every creature and every place is not simply the object of God's love. It is the material manifestation or embodiment of God's love. If you are looking for God, don't look up and away. Look down and around, because that is where the love of God is active and made real. Every creature, I like to say, is God's love variously made visible, tactile, auditory, fragrant, and delicious. If we want to live in a hopeful manner, we must learn first to perceive how God is at work and being expressed in the bodies of others, and then train and join our love with the divine love that is already there. That is what Jesus was doing in all of his ministries. And when we participate in Jesus's way of being, we move within the divine love that is the source of all authentic hope and freedom. Now, as you've already heard this week, when facing the pain and suffering in this world, it is important to make grief and lament focal concerns. It is equally important, I believe, to learn to confess repent and seek forgiveness, especially when we know that so much of the damage and pain are caused by us. Social and ecological degradation didn't and don't continue just to happen. They are the effect of political priorities and economic practices that violate land, water, and fellow creatures alike. Clearly, not all people are directly implicated in these practices, and those that are, are not necessarily implicated in the same way or to the same degree. Nonetheless, it is crucial that we emphasize the importance of confession and repentance because they are indispensable ways of restoring the relationships that make our living possible. When people seek to heal and restore the relations that have been wounded or broken by violation or neglect, they acknowledge that a human life is never lived alone. They acknowledge that they need others to flourish if they are to flourish themselves. The path toward a hopeless life, we might say, begins with the proclamation, I don't need you. This brings us to another crucial point that is fundamental to our thinking about hope and freedom, namely that life is a shared and communal reality. Scripture affirms this throughout, but so too does the experience of indigenous and agrarian peoples around the world. The idea that people can make it on their own is a fairly recent 
and I think also a highly destructive notion. To see the difference, consider the African concept of Ubuntu that Jackson was speaking about earlier this morning, which says a person is a person through other persons, or as Antje Krog, the South African poet, likes to translate it, it is interconnectedness toward wholeness. The point of a person's life is not to get and safeguard as much for oneself as is possible. It is instead to contribute to the vitality and flourishing of the communal, social, and ecological contexts that make any life possible at all. There is no hope in a life alone, nor is there genuine freedom apart from all the communal forms of nurture and support that help people realize the potential that is uniquely theirs to achieve. Given the importance of healthy and vibrant relationships in any flourishing life, we can now see why the breaking or neglect of relationships is such a catastrophe. We can also see why justice and shalom presuppose reconciled relationships. It is hard to be in the presence of another's pain and suffering. It is even harder if you know yourself to be the cause of their suffering. A strong emphasis or a strong temptation is to look away and walk on. Why? Because the recognition of one's hurtful behavior to another induces shame before them, and shame puts in motion various strategies of denial and avoidance. Why is it so hard to say, I am sorry and I accept responsibility for my wrongdoing? I don't think there is a simple or single answer to this question. Maybe we want to believe ourselves to be innocent. Maybe we think that if the whole history of wrongdoing comes to light, that we will be crushed. Maybe we worry that we won't or perhaps can't be forgiven for the wrongs we have done. I believe that a desire for forgiveness is vital to the cultivation of hope because practices like confession and repentance communicate an earnest desire to be in right or at least agreeable relationship with each other. They communicate that people want to live with each other rather than apart. Because when we live together, we can at least potentially be a help to each other. The aim of forgiveness must not be to erase or evade the wrongs, or as Lucy said, to forget the wrongs that have been done to another, because it is precisely the history of wrongs that need to be kept in view so that a less violating future can be imagined. It is instead to yearn and hope for a future in which we can be with each other in ways of mutual respect and mutual nurture. This makes forgiveness an uncommon effort. Following Paul Ricoeur, it is important to understand that both the seeking and the granting of forgiveness do not operate on a contractual level because there's a gulf between the avowal of fault and the bestowal of forgiveness. Forgiveness cannot be demanded. If it comes at all, it will be a gift beyond deserving, much like the experience of unconditional love. This keeps the practices of forgiveness at the level of a desire, or as Ricoeur says, in the optative grammatical mood that expresses a wish and a hope, if only. But a desire for what? Not for erasure or closure, not even the dissonant free harmony or wholeness that sometimes is enunciated. I believe that the desire to be forgiven is fundamentally a desire for the kind of personal and communal transformation in which people are enabled to be in meaningful relationship with others. When people confess and lament histories of wrongdoing and then commit their efforts to being a helping and healing presence going forward, they also begin to shed the defensive or self-justifying strategies that keep them from joining up with the wounded. They shed the illusion that they are innocent and exempt from a need to change. 
Confession and repentance signal the commitment to be open to, instructed by the pain and suffering of the past so that people can work together for a better future. A desire for forgiveness places people in time by making possible a more honest and educative relationship to the past. And the granting of forgiveness liberates people into a future because they now know that even in the face of error and wrongdoing, they can begin again. They can partner with others, including those wronged, in the healing of a wounded world. In this regard, I think we have something to learn from the truth and reconciliation process as it unfolded in South Africa. I know that numerous criticisms have been raised about it, but what these critics often fail to understand is that justice seeking depends on healing relationships and cultivating communities that are animated by love for each other. And this cannot happen if people live in states of humiliation, shame, or exclusion, because humiliated and excluded persons cannot participate in the life of a community that is the nurturing condition for anyone's freedom and development. The testimony of Cynthia Nagawu is instructive in this regard. Her son, Christopher, was murdered by Thapelo Mbele. Cynthia forgave the Palo when he came to confess and ask for forgiveness. And when asked why she did this, she said that by withholding forgiveness, the Palo is unable to become human again. Moreover, she herself is unable to be fully human because Cynthia assumed the Ubuntu concept that life alone is the death of life. Cynthia did not deny the pain and violation that followed from her son's murder. But for her to live fully and in hope, she needed to do whatever she could to restore the relationships, to rebuild the communities that make her life possible and potentially a joy. As she spoke of it, referencing reconciliation, if it means he becomes human again, this man, Apello, so that I, so that all of us get our, humanity, get our humanity back, then I agree, I support reconciliation. To withhold forgiveness, in other words, would be to say, I do not need you, and I do not want to be in relationship with you. Ubuntu logic goes like this. To violate another is to break relationship, and to remain in broken relationship is to impair the humanity of each. To nurture another, however, is to build a relationship. And to build a relationship is to create the conditions in which the potential of creatures can be maximally realized. I do not suppose that any of this is easy. Cynthia is a powerful rebuke to my imagination and my sense that I can make it on my own and that I can set the terms for my own flourishing. I am too much under the sway of modern neoliberal notions of persons as rugged individualists who don't really need others. But this is precisely the delusion we must resist if we are to live into our creaturely condition as always dependent upon God as the source of our life and also dependent on fellow creatures for the multiple forms of instruction and nurture they provide. Hope grows insofar as we can join with the living. For in this joining, we come into contact with the power of God that moves daily and constantly through the whole world. I think two major errors get in the way of our living into hope. One is anthropological and the other is theological. Regarding the first, the history of humanity is populated often by male teachers who argue for a heroic conception of human flourishing, a conception that shuns and despises human neediness. In other words, these teachers deny that we are creatures 
finite, vulnerable, and needy. They believe that we should live as gods, solitary, aloof, and able to make it on their own. This position has been a disaster for the earth and for human communities because these self-declared gods have developed forms of power that have coerced, enslaved, brutalized, or abandoned whomever did not serve their interests. The second error is theological and pertains to where we think hope lies. Have you heard people say, our hope is in heaven? I think this is right to say, provided we don't make a major error in our thinking about heaven. For many people, heaven is the place we go to be with God after we die. This is a big mistake. Why? Because heaven is not about our transportation to another place, but is instead about the transformation of all places and communities so that the love of God is the only power moving through us, through others, and through our lands. Transformation of life is the key, because what good would it do to transport sinful, destructive, alienating ways of being to another place, however lovely it might be? Would people not destroy the paradise we call heaven, just as we have destroyed this earthly paradise? To be in heaven is to be in any place and experience all of its life as the movement of God's love. This is why Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is among us. When we participate here and now in Jesus's way of love, we also taste, however imperfectly, the joys of heaven. This is why we pray that the will of God be realized on earth as it is in heaven. Authentic hope and freedom live in the transformation I have just described. Insofar as our lives are taken over by God's reconciling love, we also join with all the living that have God as the animating power moving within and through them. Our hope is in God. It is not somewhere else reserved for a time after we die. It is here because God is here active as the inmost breath within every breath. As scripture, as scripture comes to a close, Revelation tells us that the home of God is among mortals. God does not call us out of this world to be with God somewhere else. Rather, God is always Emmanuel, with us and within us, moving toward us to dwell with us and transform us from within. Being transformed by Christ, we also join with Christ in reconciling all things in heaven and on earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wurzba, for that beautiful reflection on a number of themes, forgiveness, hope, transformation, um, the reminder that God is with us and is made manifest and uh, his love is made manifest in all of creation and in each other. That was a beautiful image. And also that authentic hope lies in the kingdom of heaven that is among us right here and now. Um, so thank you for those words. Um, as is usual with the Center for Reconciliation Programming, we engage a theological vision and then we always invite uh, a practitioner voice as well to give us a testimony about the, the ways that they are living into uh, this calling for reconciliation, for transformation, for making love visible in the world. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our next speaker, my friend and colleague, Dorothy Clark. Reverend Dorothy Clark is the co-pastor of Changes, of Changes Paths Ministry in Durham, North Carolina. She discerned a call to work with marginalized persons soon after her call to ministry. Reverend Clark received her Master of Divinity from the Duke Divinity School and is a teaching assistant uh, at the Divinity School and a member of the Durham Cares Board of Directors. 
Reverend Clark is also an accomplished stage performer and a playwright, director, and singer, someone who combines arts and the practices and the architecture uh, of theology and peace building in her work. Dorothy, welcome this morning. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Certainly enjoyed this session so far. Um, I am going to talk to you this morning about, I'm going to start with my story, tell you a little about how I got to where I am here and then talk about the ministry that I'm involved with. Starting with my story, before I knew what liberation was in a theological sense, I had achieved liberation. Growing up in, in Georgia, I was raised in a black community. The churches I attended, the schools I attended, the neighborhoods that I lived in were all black. Once I stepped out of that black environment, rarely did I escape being called a nigger. It's a word we don't like to hear, but that's my history. One memorable day as I walked through a white neighborhood on my way downtown because there were no buses and still are no buses in Thomasville, I, I, I was passed by a brand new, beautiful yellow convertible. There were four white teenage boys in the car. The driver passed me and then slowed down and waited for me to catch up. When I was side by side with the car, he yelled out, nigger bitch, and sped off. On that street, on that summer day in Thomasville, Georgia, I resolved that I would never again hear that word without retaliating. Fast forward, one year later, I had received a scholarship to attend the mountain school in Versa, Vermont. There were students there from various parts of the United States, as well as a few foreign countries. One day I was talking for, to a female student from, and I can't remember which country, if it was either New Zealand or Australia because I got the accents confused. We were having a conversation when I heard her call me nigger. Having made a promise to myself the previous year, I hit her. The school directors acted swiftly and called a school-wide meeting. The student and I were each asked to tell our version of what happened. As I spoke, I noticed we were sitting next to each, across from each other and I noticed that she started to cry. When she spoke, it was my turn to be amazed. Because of her accent, I had misunderstood her words. She didn't call me a nigger at all. On the contrary, she was comparing me to a beloved character in her country named Niger. One letter caused me to misunderstand completely. She was crying because she had hurt my feelings. This was a moment of transition for me. Never ever had a white person express regret for offending me. And I had most certainly never seen a white person cry because they hurt my feelings. It was the beginning of liberation for me. I had, I admit, had one or two more physical encounters, but I would always remember that white girl who became my friend and who cried because she hurt my feelings. I was liberated from a binary world of black and white. When I graduated from the mountain school, more and more I moved into an integrated society. 
I attended college at Brown University where there was a greater mix of all races. My first corporate job was at IBM where I dealt with people from around the country and the world. Slowly, I was to learn that not all non-Black people were like the ones that I grew up around in Thomasville, Georgia. The ministry that I work with here is Change Path Ministry. The people we serve are primarily active drug users. We also support homeless residents and low wage earners. We support people of all races, ethnicities, who are used to being shunned and avoided. We offer a place on the porch where they are welcome and there is someone actually glad to see them and to have conversation with them. We distribute snack bags and a hot meal on Wednesdays and Sundays. We offer an abbreviated religious service on Sundays. We're non-denominational ministry. We've had guest sermons from Methodists, Baptists, Muslims, and some more that I can't recall. Many of the people who frequent the ministry have been residents in traditional rehab facilities. Some completed a program while others were unable to endure the regiment. We take a different approach of helping and allowing persons to find their desire to change. We do encourage people to enter a facility, but only when they decide they are ready to go. When they make that decision, we will take them or pay transportation to send them to whatever facility they want to attend. We discovered that if a person decides on their own that now is the time, they have a much greater chance of completing the program. But not all the people we serve are regular attendants. In the past year, we started seeing people who don't normally attend food giveaways, but the combination of gentrification and the pandemic hit low wage earners really hard. In that same period, we started going to neighborhoods in East Durham to feed people. We take bags of food to various communities where people are homeless. Food is our primary focus, but not the only one. We also give away clothes, shoes, and socks. There's a, a table permanently stationed on the porch where people are free to take what they need when they need it. Every winter we have a sock drive because people who are on the street continuously go through socks really fast and need constant replenishing. Our hope for the ministry. In this past, um, in September, we will enter the sixth year of operation. And we have started to gain a sense of stability. We're coming into our own and believing that we really are and will be a permanent part of the community. We have the support of various community churches who on occasion supply food and clothing. We have a growing roster of ministers who are ready and willing to deliver a message to the waiting congregation. This spring, we received our first grant to purchase food for the people we serve. And our most exciting event is the com completion of a new house for the ministry. We're in the process of organizing a fundraiser to begin this month. Our sincere hope is to raise enough funds to pay the mortgage of the house this year. We can then focus on raising money for meal programs and establishing ongoing workshops for the community as well as regular participants. We have the audacity to believe that if God brought us this far, he'll see us through to the end. Now I can talk about the impact that I've had on Change Path Ministry 
But on a more personal level, I'd like to leave you with the impact that Change Path Ministry has had on me. I discerned a call to this type of ministry before I even knew what it was. How is that possible, you might ask? Well, the first time I talked to ministers at my home church, um, which is Mount Level, the minister asked me what area of ministry I intended to pursue. Immediately, immediately, I said, outreach. I then went home and had to look up what that meant because I had no idea what outreach was. I realized then that the Holy Spirit had forced that word out of my mouth because that was the area where I was being assigned. And I was to learn that when God speaks, it's as good as done. On my first internship at the Divinity School, I worked with a Baptist church in Roxborough. There I had an opportunity to meet the district attorney as he was in the process of developing a plan to for a ministry that would go into low income neighborhoods to spread the love of Jesus. I worked with him on that ministry for two and a half years, never anticipating that it was preparation for the ministry I'm with now. I was invited to stay on at the, at the church in Roxborough as an associate minister. And I left that church only to join the newly formed Change Paths Ministry here in Durham. Here was an opportunity to work closely with people as they confronted their demons. Here was a chance to share my story with persons one-on-one -on -one who felt unworthy, who felt unloved even by God. Most importantly, here was a chance to respond to the call that God had placed on my life. I had run from it long enough. Now was the time to answer. I find joy in, in doing this difficult work because I know that God had faith enough in me to hire me for the job. My goal is to live up to the motto of the ministry, of Change Path Ministry. Our motto is meeting you on your current path, walking with you to your crossroads, and standing with you as you choose a new path. It is sometimes a painful experience, but I consider it joy to do what others, what God has done for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for your words that contextualize, um, not only contextualize hope and action and loving the least of these among us, but also um, the sense of calling. If, if we were to have more time, the next stage in the Word Made Flesh methodology is about calling and how we put into action um, however we're uniquely gifted and prepared, um, how we put things into action. And um, so you're kind of leading us into the next step a bit. Um, as someone said earlier today, we are continuing the conversation. This is an opening. Um, and in that frame, we are going to have some small group time now. I do hope that everyone who's on the call will stay in your small group time and participate as much as you are able uh, within the limitations of technology. And we're going to take 20 minutes today in our small groups to reflect on what we've heard this week, what you've heard particularly this morning from Norman and Dorothy. And then we will gather back together uh, 
with the full conversation, the full congregation that's gathered this morning. So um, Morgan has ably assisted us all week. She has put you in small groups and you will be automatically funneled to your small group and also exited back into the room um, in about 20 minutes. Welcome back. We are still having a few people trickle back from their groups, but I uh, hope you had a productive conversation in your small group time. Yeah. And now we are back in uh, the larger body and we'll have time for a few things just to give you an outline of where we're going. Um, we'll have some time for a larger group discussion now. And I have opened the chat so that when you are communicating, if you click on everyone, um, your comments or questions will be in the chat visible for the whole group to see. Um, we'll spend a, a few moments um, maybe having some reflections and some significant uh, questions that we might direct particularly to our two speakers this morning, to Norman and Dorothy. Um, and then there will be some time um, for uh, some kind of closing remarks. It is our last session together. And so we'll do some, some closing comments before um, a final closing and prayer for benediction. So with that, uh, I'm going to share my screen with the um, two presenters. And I'm going to invite you uh, in our in our audience to bring your questions, bring your comments. What did you hear or um, were particularly um, find meaningful in your small group conversation that you would like to propose? Um, there is a, a comment um, already in the chat from Dr. Balmaceda wanting to thank Norman for acknowledging the potential and importance of truth commissions. But what other comments or reflections or questions do we have? We'll take about 20 minutes. Of course, everyone is silent. <laughs> so group leaders, if there was anything important in, in your small group time that you want to lift, I invite you to bring that. Well, one thing that we said in our, our group was um, just trying to to have this hope uh, of with the living, but how to do it when there's superiority in place. Uh, and so you forgive and you try to interconnect. You forgive and try to stay in this relationship. But how does is that how does a time when you need to stand up and resist or how does that function in uh, was. Thank you for the question. And did you hear that okay, Norman and Dorothy? Um, Norman, would you like to begin? Yeah, the, the question of power is really, really important. And I think um, it's, it's clear that there's all sorts of power imbalances in almost any conversation that's going to happen. And this is why I think it's important to try to saturate the kind of speaking to each other, often within communal contexts where people can point out to people who are not aware or don't want to acknowledge power dynamics that are in play. And, you know, the, I, I just think of a line from Flannery O'Connor in one of her stories where she says, we are not our own lights. We're very good at deceiving ourselves about our own humility, about our own honesty, about our goodness. And we need other people to hold us account. And I think you know, one of the reasons I emphasize creatureliness is because every one of us by definition is marked by neediness. And, and people who are in power often want to start with the assumption, I'm not the one who needs. And, and I think that's the great temptation that we need to resist and we need other people to help us resist that temptation. Thanks, Norman. So. 
Nina's um, question actually came through in a number of uh, individual texts. So I'm going to see if I can summarize. So in addition to thanking you for acknowledging the potential and importance of truth commissions, um, Nina's pointing out that she thinks we should also acknowledge and denounce the lack of follow-up on the recommendations that are given by the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that contributes to social healing in lands affected by violence and injustice. And um, I'm wondering, I think, what, you know, how we deal with that. And in, in, in the context, um, if, if we don't follow up, then it, it often looks like the work of the Truth Commission is more like an excuse for impunity. Yeah, so, I mean, that's one of the big criticisms about the South African process, right? That shortly after, um, it went quickly in the direction of giving people impunity and a, a new way of creating systems of shame, systems of exclusion came into being. And, and you know, one way to think about this is to say that what, say, Bishop Tutu was emphasizing as the starting point, this Ubuntu concept, was quickly dismissed. And, and new power brokers came to play that wanted to denounce others and, you know, conceal the truth. And people used the concept of amnesty that was being talked about in the commission as a way to simply forget and you know put under the rug any of the abuses of the past which of course is is the great problem right forgiveness is not about forgetting the past it's not about sweeping things under the rug forgiveness is about using the past as a way to make sure we don't continue in the paths of violation or abuse or neglect uh, but to do that, you also have to have forgiveness because it's what makes possible life together again, that we can start again, even in the histories of wounding. And I think that the trouble is that you have people who, who become very defensive and they don't want to admit the wounding that, that they're doing. And so, yeah, that the TRC derailed very quickly. No question. Yeah. Yeah, and I think as Nina points out in the chat as well, that yeah, that's also the case in other truth commissions, Argentina, Peru, El Salvador, Guatemala, Greensboro, you can go on and on, right, with, with where these processes have happened, and it is one of the critiques, um, and, and yet um, we still do have hope um, that, um, that there's importance in the truth telling. And as you said, that we need to remember, um, we need to know our history. I think that was said in, a, in one of our previous sessions. Um, we, if we don't know our history, um, then we can't move forward in positive ways if we forget about it. Um, so that forgive and forget concept is, is not the frame we should be operating from. So moving in a slightly different tack, um, Jody Sparger writes that on Wednesday, Dr. Balmaceda talked about the possibility of reconciliation, sometimes meaning walking away from a perpetrator of violence. Actually, I think maybe Alma Tinoco Rodriguez said that. But anyway, um, the, the question then is uh, for you, either of you, to, relate, uh, to respond to that in light, particularly Norman, in your conversation about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, what thoughts do you have? Yeah, I mean, context is everything, right? Knowing how to read the context in which someone maybe offers repentance or withholds it, or someone's trying to offer forgiveness or withhold it. I mean, the context will be so important to, to have some clarity about. And, and this is where, again, the communal context, we need other people to help us read what's happening. Because it's very clear that people can use the, the work of repentance or even confession as a power ploy to further heart hurt or, or harm somebody else or to have a position of power over another. And in situations like that, absolutely a person needs to walk away. I mean, the goal of what, what forgiveness is, is driving at, I think is something called fidelity. And there's no question that fidelity can be taken advantage of. I mean, Ryan asked this also in, in the comment in the chat session section. All of the best things like love, like forgiveness, can be abused. And this is what makes it so hard for us to try to keep promoting them, because we know they can be abused and perverted in some of the most horrifying sorts of ways. 
and to, to find the ways to do the interpretive work of understanding when is the perversion actually happening? What are sort of the, the instigators or the ignitions that are, are putting us on the path of perversion? Um, we need to be on the lookout for that and we need the help of each other to be on the lookout for that. Because again, I don't think that we're always clear about how even our best intentions are going to harm other people. Yeah, thanks. Dorothy. Thank um, so, yeah, I have to say something about forgiveness because that was something that I had to, that I had to learn. I was, I was a big one for payback. You know, you, um, you do something to harm me and I'm going to think about it until I come up with the best way to pay you back. And <laughs> so I'll tell you, God has had a lot of, a lot of work to do on me and has, has actually has done it. So I had to come to understand that sometimes the worst thing you can do to a person who's trying to harm you is to forgive them because they no longer have a, they no longer have a legitimate means or a reason to continue to be the bully towards you. So if you forgive someone who's, who's trying to just stir up and they're just trying to stir up a problem. Oh, that, that can just, it throws them off guard. And it leaves you the ability to go home to rest. You don't have to worry about, oh, what am I going to do? What do I have to worry about this person tomorrow? I don't have to worry about them. Because whatever they do, they cannot provoke me. Um, and so for, I've come to understand that to the ability or the choice to forgive is a very, very strong weapon. <laughs> so you can see which of the two in this group here has the real wisdom, Dorothy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was remembering, I think it's Desmond Tutu, who also we've, we've mentioned, um, you know, talks about the concept of Ubuntu, but he, he has written powerfully on forgiveness and the, mm -hmm. the processes and actually forgiveness, being able to extend it, it's a liberating thing for the person who's been harmed it is. To, be, to, get, to give the forgiveness. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it is a liberating thing. So when we're talking about liberation, I think sometimes the danger also is when we're demanding forgiveness or it's like a forced condition, that maybe that's cheap forgiveness. Sometimes we talk about cheap hope or cheap, you know, cheap reconciliation, whatever. I think, I think that's not genuine, but when it's authentically, um, yeah, generated, then, then it's very powerful. Yeah. Um, one of the groups, um, one of our small group leaders um, mentioned that their group spent some time talking about um, the, definition that Dr. Colonna Marie gave us this morning about hope not being confused with optimism and wondering if either of you have any thoughts to elaborate on what he offered. I think there's, there's, there's a lot to say about it. I think one thing I would note is that optimism seems to operate on this idea that we can anticipate what the future will be. And I think if history teaches us anything at all is, is that we don't know how to anticipate what the future will be. And so we need to suspend that desire to think that um, we know what it's gonna look like down the road and that we have the good plan to get us there. There's often so much hubris in those kinds of efforts. And along the way, a tremendous amount of violence is done to try to make sure that the plan I made for the future comes to fruition. And Hope operates in a very different modality than optimism because hope is a movement that happens in relative darkness. What we do when we hope is we commit to love and we don't know what's gonna be the effect of that. It can be beautiful, but it can also go terribly wrong. And all that we can do is say, we want to try to love better. Mm. And we leave what happens down the road to God. And so, you know, there's a reason why um, hope is an expression of faith and love in a way that optimism is not. Optimism yeah. is often an expression of hubris. Yeah, thank you. Dorothy, anything to add? 
I would just add um, a lot of my wisdom comes from song. I mean, it, the songs come from, from the Bible, but um, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And if I can remember, if in a situation I can remember that to just hope out of the air means nothing, but my hope being built on Jesus' blood and righteousness, then I can look forward to, I can, I can go into the, the future or whatever the situation, believing that there really is hope. But if it is just hoping that I can on my own do something or hoping that you will do the right thing, it's not going to get me anywhere. Yeah. Thank you. A couple more comments. Uh, Reverend Regina Graham, our colleague at Divinity School, reminds us that forgiveness does not mean ignoring what has been done or putting a false label on an evil act. But rather, it means that the, the evil act no longer remains as a barrier to the relationship and that Forgiveness is a catalyst for creating that atmosphere necessary for a fresh start and a new beginning. And she reminds us that MLK Jr., Martin Luther King Jr. was uh, advocating for that as well. So when we think about the saints that we have, that we name, who have given us the, the vision of a, a different way of thinking about things and new frames to operate from, um, we also had a question from somebody, I'm trying to find it here in the chat now, uh, where someone asked both of you, if, if um, what have the people you know who have tried a new path and forgiven themselves enough to see themselves and others as embodiments of God taught you about how our larger U.S. culture can escape its addi addictions to racism, power, and forgive itself when it's facing the ills of, of the current day. And that came from our student, Tobias Pigney. Don't know if you have- Can you say the first part again? What? Yeah. So um, what, what examples do you have from people that you know who've tried this new path and forgiven themselves enough to see themselves in, in others as embodiments of God? Um, what have those people or those examples taught you about how our larger U.S. culture can escape some of our addictions to things like racism and power? That's a really deep and difficult question, I think, because um, there's so many factors in play about honest self-recognition to start with. And and, and I think I would start by saying it, it's remarkable how easy it is for each of us to fool ourselves about ourselves. And, and the moments of a truthful awakening to who we are, they often don't come easily because we, we like the notions of ourselves. And I think this plays out on the, na the national stage too. Americans love to think about themselves as the greatest nation on earth. And, and it's a kind of self-delusion that nations can live within, but also people, individual people can live within. And so shattering the delusion is often a very painful thing, which in my own experience has taught me that to come to a true, honest estimation of ourselves is often a very painful process because we have to shed the things we've been telling ourselves for quite a long time. And the fact that we know it can happen, and I, I can think of examples where people have come to a more honest realization of who they are. Those are moments of real transformation. And so it happens often by something outside pricking the balloon that we built around ourselves. And, and maybe you know some of what's been happening this past year with BLM and others are an indication that the balloon that we've been living within, it needs pricking because we're not being honest with ourselves and each other. One of the things that I've seen, um, <clears throat> that I've seen in um, the, the people in come through the ministry, on Wednesdays, we have conversation on the porch. Anybody can come up with any question or anything they want to talk about. And we will, that will be our subject for the evening. 
and it is my job along with it is my job and Reverend Jones job to bring the conversation back to the Bible somehow without <laughs> but something that um, people often have the notion that they're just not worthy. They are not worthy and they have no, they have no right to desire or to hope for something better because for me, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. God doesn't know me. God doesn't care about me. So it is trying to have the person have access to the person's ears long enough so that they can hear you repeatedly tell them God does care. God does, does, does want the best for you. God wants this. You have to believe that God cares for you. And it's, it's a, it's a rep repetitive thing to just have to feed into people long enough for them to think, maybe, maybe, if you can get them to maybe, there's a chance of, 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 mm -hmm. step of going forward to the point that they will believe that God really does care. But that's the, that I've discovered is a big, big barrier to um, a lot of folks, especially if they've done something that's outside the norm. They know that I've, what I've done is just so terrible. God will never forgive me. And he doesn't care. So. And, and that's, maybe that's that. Brilliant, Dorothy. I mean, I think th this is where, um, you are a witness to that possibility because mm -hmm. they come to you and they see you affirm them, right? It's one thing to say, God loves you. Mm -hmm. That's very abstract. But when they see that you're doing it already mm -hmm. it, as a witness to God's love for them, I think that's the real key. It's, it's this making flesh of the forgiveness in you that God is constantly asking us to do as a witness to God's forgiveness of mm -hmm. us. And, and I think it's simultaneously easy to understand what it is and immensely difficult to put into action. And so um, I think it is, it is powerful to have your witness with us this morning about ways to do that. A couple of other comments that are coming in. Um, a past participant of the Institute, Tasha, reminds us that um, forgiveness can be cyclical and that she remembers hearing uh, when she attended the Summer Institute a few years ago, that one of the speakers said through her own experience that she found that she had to repeatedly forgive the same person uh, for a particular trauma. And I think um, this is probably true also when we're thinking about big sins like racism. We have to repeatedly uh, forgive and confess and learn how to um, you know, overcome our sense of shame to get out of our, poke our bubbles enough to be able to actively uh, enter into making reparation and being in the spirit of wanting to. Um, and it's something we have to do over and over again every day. Um, and we have to choose to do. Um, so thank you for that comment, Tasha. And then Jackson Adama um, reminds us that hope is listed as a theological virtue in the letters of Paul to the church. And um, and he also says, as a theological virtue, it appears to be something that is infused into us from outside of ourselves, like it's a gift of the Holy Spirit in some ways. Um, so how do we juxtapose this with a hope that's grounded in the reality of our creatureliness or humanity? Well, I think I would start by saying that it's not oppositional, right? That God's transcendence has never been opposed to God's imminence. And so the very reality that we call creatureliness is already God's presence in, among, through us. And so it's not as though we could ever be in a state where God has been removed from us so as to have to come to us from outside, right? I want to resist that whole way of thinking and to say that by virtue of our being any creature at all, God is already present to us as the source of our being, the source of our nurture, the source of our beauty. And so it's about a kind of tapping into something, some power, some reality that has always been present to us and waiting. And the, the difficulty is that we put up so many blocks 
to prevent the presence of God from being felt by us, by being known by us. And so the, the virtue for sure is not located from within us as a power that is ours. Right? The power is always God's, but it's never been outside of us is sort of the way I'd start that. Thank you. Any closing comments that either of you would like to make, uh, Dorothy or Norman, on this topic? Hope, liberation, forgiveness. Oh, one thing I would add to um, what I was saying before about pour, having to pour into people repeatedly to when people are convinced that they are unforgivable and unlovable, you have to be willing to share the things that you have done, the, the sins that you have committed as a, as evidence that God does forgive. You know, I've, I've had to tell stories of, of things that I've done and then, but look, but God called me to preach his word, to, to deliver his word. So if he can forgive me, yes, he can forgive you. Um, so just wanted to throw that one in. Thank you, Dorothy. That's a great, a great concluding comment to, and reminder for us. Um, and it kind of echoes also what our friends John and Karen Friesen have written, um, who are joining us from Egypt this morning, or probably not this morning for them, um, that this is not a one-time event. And whether it's a truth and reconciliation commission, whether it's forgiveness, whether it's our work for reconciliation. It is the role of the church and it is work that is ongoing. So that's a good place for us to, um, as we draw near the end of our time together um, today, um, to, to conclude there with this time and, and transition. And I wanna thank both of you for your presence with us this morning and for your insights and thoughts. Um, as we come to, the conclusion of this 2021 Institute for Reconciliation. We've really been blessed to be on the journey with wonderful speakers, volunteers, um, and all of you who have been joining in from around the globe um, to engage in this time set apart for listening, learning, and talking together. And um, we're gonna pause for a few moments. I'm gonna turn the mic over to uh, our director. Um, Dr. Edgardo Colonna Marique, and then I will conclude us at the end with another poem and a blessing um, as we go out and maybe a few announcements. Edgardo? Sure, thank you. And uh, I think that we have been journeying together and in our journey, we have now met some new uh, sojourners, some new pilgrims and I find that uh, in these days of Zoom, we can now uh, realize that we, we're not alone, uh, that we are, we are a, uh, a great uh, multitude already, really here out of many nations and languages. And that uh, when we uh, hit our button to leave uh, this meeting, uh, we, need to, we should remember that our pilgrimage continues. And I want to just for a few moments invite you to in the, use the chat function to name a gift that you have received in, the, in our short uh, days of being together. We spoke of the big kind of theological gifts of the, the, the uh, reconciliation towards what, the gift of new creation. We spoke of uh, what's going, where are we, what's going on, how do we get here, and the gift of lament. We spoke of... Uh, of, of what is hope and the gift of liberation, but you may have received other gifts uh, that are more concrete, that have uh, stories attached to them, that have personal names attached to them. And I just invite you to uh, just drop them in the chat function uh, as we uh, are rounding our time together. Uh, so somebody just, I just saw the word patience come up. Uh, so I think of our journey uh, those who know me, there, there's, a, there's a verse from uh, poet Pablo Neruda that I like to quote, uh, which is, Al amanecer, armados de una paciencia ardiente, entraremos en las espléndidas ciudades. At dawn, 
armed with a burning patience, we will enter the, the celestial cities. And I think that, that for me, that, that, is a, that is what keeps us on the journey. It's another way of speaking of hope. That's this burning patience. It, it stretches. It, it, it's a, I cannot contain it within my bones. It just wants to come out. And that is the, what I've seen in so many of you who have been, uh, uh, with whom I've been journeying over the last couple of days. And so I see more of these gifts being uh, placed in our, and being dropped in the chat. And I wanted to also, as part of naming of gifts, uh, name the gifts of some of our, uh, our leaders in this, in this work. In addition to the presenters and the panelists who have been so extraordinary, I need to also mention, of course, uh, our translators uh, who have been helping us throughout this whole time to remain connected uh, and to find that uh, language differences are gifts and, uh, and that they do not divide, uh, they enrich and, and the translators have been building bridges for us. So thank you, Abigail Smith, for your work in translation. And, uh, and also thank you to Roberto Chia Cherre for your work also in translating for us. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Morgan Dines, our student associate for her support uh, work that she has been doing for us and in keeping us on track with some of the various technologies and, and facilitating our time. And uh, of course, uh, Valerie uh, Helbert, who has been really uh, instrumental uh, uh, and the architect of the Summer Institute. Thank you so much, Valerie. And all these Thanksgivings, uh, we lift up to God uh, who has given us uh, the gift of Jesus Christ uh, in whom all things hold together and in whom God is seeking to reconcile all things, things in heaven and things on earth. So thank you so much to all of you and back to you, Valerie. Thank you, Edgardo. I am suddenly having difficulties with my technology. So I am sorry that I was not able to uh, put I don't know why I can't. <laughs> uh, I was trying to put up the um, uh, pictures of the people that were being um, spoken about. Here's Morgan. You can see Morgan quickly. And unfortunately, I have lost Roberto in the um, in my thing. But um, he he has been a godsend to um, not only have our wonderful translators. Um, but I also want to thank our small group leaders and, um, yeah, just people who helped, uh, in the background and keeping me sane <laughs> as we went through this. And also my colleague, um, Nina Balmaceda, thank you so much for your help in planning this event and, uh, and coordinating it. Big thank you to everyone who has joined us. And I know that people have been in and out. And so um, we're not even all here at this moment um, for the full richness of the Institute. But I do have just a few closing thoughts and then we'll have a few announcements as well. We do invite you to continue to engage with the Center for Reconciliation and other programs of the Divinity School as we all collectively seek to grow our network of pilgrims that are working to bring about God's justice, healing, and wholeness in a broken world. Early next week, everyone who has registered for the Institute in one format or the other um, will be receiving a follow-up email from me that will give you information about when and how you can access the recordings that we've made of these six sessions that we've had together. We'll also be providing contact information for our key speakers and uh, some of our partner initiatives and a resource list. This is gonna be a work for Morgan and myself next week, a resource list that has been generated from the content of the sessions, both in the presentations and the Zoom chat. There have been lots of great books and, and links and sites mentioned, and we're gonna try to collate that together um, that will also come out in the follow-up email. And as people have said, many people have said during this week, 
this is the start of the conversation. This is not the end. And yet, as we learned in our first session, we know where the end is. We've seen the vision of where we're headed. And we know that we, God is with us in this work, that we're not in it alone. And for me, that's one of the biggest gifts of this institute every year is to uh, remind myself and reimmerse myself in this reality that we are not walking this path alone. And so I invite you, I've been sharing poems this week from uh, this book, How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope. And I have a short poem for us entitled Hope. Um, the poet is Rosemary Watola Tromer. Hope, hope has holes in its pockets. It leaves little crumb trails so that we, when anxious, can follow it. Hope's secret, it doesn't know the destination. It knows only that all roads begin with one foot in front of the other. So I think we know the destination, but I like this imagery of us continuing this, being in pilgrimage and, and putting one foot in front of the other. If we had more time tomorrow, we would talk about our calling and our vocation and how that plays into it. But I leave you with the, the questions to think about that. How do we go out and be the hands and feet, the embodiment of uh, all the, the call that we've had this week to, to live into um, new creation? As we begin to put one foot in front of the other, and follow hope's crumbs. Join me in a brief prayer of Cindy. Ever present God, in Christ Jesus, you never leave us or forsake us. Teach us to be faithful to your call, to persevere in commitment and beyond all else, to know the strength and joy of being near to you. In the name of our savior. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. We're going to have a few slides that Morgan will share. And then if anyone wants to linger for a few moments, we can also, um, uh, I'll stop having myself as the spotlight and we can do gallery view and wave at everyone after the, after the closing slides. I can see that Morgan's trying to... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.